In this video, we're going to talk about ChargePoint, trading under the ticker symbol CHPT. Before today's video begins, just a quick heads up that not all my content is made on the same day they're posted. If there are material events happening afterwards, I will then make a follow-up video to reflect those changes. With that being said, let's begin with today's topic. ChargePoint is a startup specialized in providing recharging solutions for electric and hybrid vehicles. It was one of the more popular stocks that went public back in 2020 era, while the interest in the field was at a historical peak. Many believed that the electric vehicle sector is going to grow significantly over the next few decades, and to a large extent, that will be the case. The positive aspect about ChargePoint is that it allows investors to invest in the sector without carrying the company-specific risks, because all the brands of vehicles need to recharge their batteries at some point, and ChargePoint would be one of those companies to benefit from the increasing demand overall. ChargePoint also enjoys an annual growth rate between 35-55% to 55 of its revenue. Its business model is very straightforward, consisting of building charging station networks that drivers can find on their phone, which is similar to a roadmap of gas stations for combustion engine vehicles. It provides solutions for both individual and commercial clients. Overall, the company shows a lot of potential as it allows investors to have exposure on the entire EV sector and has successfully mitigated the company's specific risks. When we look at the company's website, we can see that it is growing its client base and the number of revenue streams. So overall, I think that fundamentally speaking, ChargePoint has a bright future ahead of it. So looking at ChargePoint from a fundamental and technical perspective, it is not difficult to see why investors back in the days were willing to pour in a lot of capital in the company when the stock price of Tesla was getting multiplied by 10. Like I said before, the business model of ChargePoint and of similar companies is to put their hopes on the significant increase of the electric vehicles market overall in terms of how many vehicles are going to be driven and out of them how many are going to be electric in the years and decades to come, which will also come from additional demand of charging stations. Unlike many other growth stocks we've covered so far, ChargePoint does have a seizable portion of its shareholders who are institutional money managers, and their presence does reassure me to some extent. However, going forward, we have to consider another significant factor, which is time. In other words, whether the market is willing to wait for the stock to achieve profitability, which may or may not happen within the short or even medium term. Looking at the price action of ChargePoint, I think that it is part of a major capital movement that started in early 2021 and has now resumed once again. Investors are now looking to protect their capital instead of chasing big gains, which, by the way, was the initial reason why so much of it was parked in the electric vehicle sector in the first place. Because there seems to be a secret consensus back in the days about the fact that SPACs and startups can immediately take off in the stock market, but those days are long gone. Another aspect which I wish to reiterate at this point in time is that different market cycles will affect individual stocks, regardless of their individual fundamentals. And it is no different with ChargePoint. If you look at other popular growth stocks on the market, it is not difficult to see that they are also having a very difficult time as we speak. And speaking of which, we may also talk about the NASDAQ potential reversal in the following weeks, if possible. Now, let's move on to ChargePoint's technical aspects. The trading volume of ChargePoint has recently been 7.9 million shares compared to an average volume of 10.5 million shares. Over the previous 52-week period, its price fluctuated between $11.21 and $43. The market cap of ChargePoint is currently at $4.7 billion, compared to an enterprise value of $7.72 billion. 
The difference between the market cap and its enterprise value is the premium or discount financial market is willing to allocate to the company based on its current fundamentals, leverage, and asset composition. Some of the examples of impact by leverage is if the company has a lot of debt, then the market at large may feel uncertain about the company's capacity to pay back its interest and principles, which in turn may negatively impact its profitability, attractiveness, and even solvency. One key element to note regarding the enterprise value is that for many growth-type companies, one of the most significant assets they own is called goodwill. Goodwill is basically an expectation of the market that the company is able to generate more profit or to have more growth than other companies, partially because it has a good management, stronger brand recognition, bigger following online, and other elements as such. It is basically what is unique about this company in particular compared to an alternative competitor. In other words, it's not a tangible asset that companies may use. However, it's often the reason why some companies are perceived to be trading at a discount, because the market cap is lower than the enterprise value, which is the value that market gives to its assets if all the debts are paid off. In case the company goes to liquidation, however, goodwill would be completely gone, and we would be left with potentially less assets to distribute than what we initially thought the company has. In comparison to its historical price fluctuations, the stock is currently 20% higher than the one-month low, 20% higher than the three-month low, and 20% higher than the 52-week low. On the options market, which is often a hint on the market sentiment on where the stock price is likely going to go, the implied volatility is 78.6% compared to a historical volatility of 76.5%. The put-call volume ratio is currently at 0.6. It is normal for most stocks to tend to have a higher put option volume than what they deserve because many institutional investors choose to hedge their exposure by buying more options. The most recent volume of options traded has been 12.6 thousand contracts within a day compared to the 30-day average volume of 19.9 thousand. In terms of open interest, the most recent volume of open interest has been 170,000 contracts compared to the 30-day average of 218,000 contracts. Regarding the shareholder structure, institutional shareholders hold about 30% of the company. The biggest shareholders include Vanguard, the Canadian Pension Plan, and BlackRock. Understanding the shareholder structure is relevant to an extent because it helps to determine if you should hold the stock long-term or to view it as a short-term volatility play. The stock is mainly held by retail traders, then it may be a sign that the stock lacks the depth to justify long-term trust from shareholders. Usually the consensus is that there gotta be about 25-30% to 30 of institutional ownership in order to be perceived as a sound investment and not just a trade. This is obviously subject to a lot of exceptions since many good companies are also mostly held by retail investors and not institutional ones, but those tend to be the exceptions and not the rule. Let's also take a look at the short interest present in the stock, which is the amount of positions aiming to profit if the share price falls lower. Sometimes there are significant short interest in the total volume. It could be a sign that there is an organized shorting operation going on, like what is going on with GameStop and AMC. The current short interest is 13.6% of total floats and 62.8% of the dark pool transactions. Now, let's take a look at the indicators. Financial indicators give us a suggestion of what the price movements are showing and they can be used as one of the elements to determine what should be our overall approach. The oscillators are showing one sell, nine neutral, and one buy, with an overall tendency of neutral. The moving averages of the past price actions show 13 sell, one neutral, and one buy, with an overall tendency of strong sell. Keep in mind that the indicators often show that the present and past performances of the stock, but 
rarely predict accurately the future, if at all. Nevertheless, they are relevant to determine if the current timing of the trade is the right one. Regarding pivot points, which are levels of support and resistance sprinkled in the price trends, the support levels are $6.24, $9.59, and $11.66. For the resistance levels, they are $14.65, $15.46, and $23.80. My overall opinion is that charge points should remain on your watch list and there comes a point at which it would be a decent entry point for people to get in. I personally don't believe that this point has been reached yet, as we still have to wait and see where the support will start to be present going forward. My recommendation is to allocate between 1-3% to of your portfolio in charge point, and to wait for more support before entering the stock. Your investment should also take into consideration the market conditions and the surrounding sentiment to determine what kind of asset should be picked, for how much and for how long. First of all, the financial market doesn't reflect the real economy. If the stock market is doing great, it doesn't necessarily mean that companies are hiring people, that salaries and living standards are rising. Sometimes it's the exact opposite that happens. Because the stock market is a pool of money, where things come in and come out, going to different sectors to be placed. The capital may be used to be invested in a company to improve its efficiency and productivity, but it can also be used to buy up shares and assets in order to make a profit. This phenomenon is called financialization, and it means that the more money has been used for non-productive purposes like merger and acquisitions, fees to financial sectors, buying back equity and so on, the less there is for the real economy. Another way to put it is that ever since 2008, the Dow Jones has increased significantly. But people don't necessarily see this growth in tangible ways. This is why we got to be careful with the assumptions that rising stock price means better outlook for the company. Sometimes it doesn't mean anything other than the fact that the asset is getting more expensive to be bought and that their yields is going down as a result. Additionally, some new phenomenons are now palpable, such as the creation of new bubbles, the participation and influence of retail traders in specific situations, and the anticipation of a massive recession or at least pullback. Bubbles have always been created on and off over the past few centuries, but nowadays, it's quite interesting to see the speed at which an organic bubble can be created back in 2020. Because almost immediately after the major collapse of the financial market back in early 2020, the market decided to pour a massive amount of capital in the EV sector and anything that's related to it. Stock prices went up the sky and for a moment, it really felt like any EV stock can be a golden goose. Another way to say this is that any SPAC with an EV company in it will become the next Tesla, right? Even if it didn't last that long, this episode definitely allowed the market participants to park a lot of their money in a sector, leaving it with either a lot of profits or at least avoiding incurring large losses because they left their money in the blue chips or the sectors heavily affected. The involvement of retail traders in companies has also been much more pronounced in recent months, especially in the scenarios of a short squeeze. Companies may have short sellers who believe that the stock will decrease in value. The short squeeze consists of buying the stock price up to force the short sellers to recover their positions, which will then also trigger an even bigger increase of stock price as a result. Of course, I'm not saying that this is always rational. I'm not even saying that those companies always have a convincing narrative. So, for example, if you play video games, ask yourself if you personally bought all your games at GameStop, knowing that you can buy the same games just online in the comfort of your home. But nevertheless, retail traders do have a much more significant influence in the stock price nowadays, for the better or worse, 
Personally, I think that as long as the volatility is high or gets higher, it'll create more opportunities. The final phenomenon is the anticipation of a recession. Many people have been expecting something of that sort to happen ever since 2008. There were quite a few companies that were supposed to go bankrupt because their debt structure is no longer sustainable or that their business model is bad. But overall, the system was able to hold its ground, especially in the North American market. This is partially because capital around the world often choose to come to the American capital market when things get heated back home. This is especially the case when geopolitical tensions increase around the world. In order to make sure that capital can provide a steady return without being affected too much by the central bank policies and inflations, I think that this phenomenon will increase its pace as time passes by, at least for the next couple of years. This is why we will likely see the blue chips continuing their ascension, even if the growth stocks, even if for the growth stocks, things may be a lot more nuanced. The bottom line in all this is that the environment is getting more uncertain and volatile in a context where asset yields will probably remain quite low because the real economy cannot be improved with just money. As far as we're concerned, this means that the patience would be a great virtue for all of us and that there will be plenty of opportunities to eye for better prices. With that being said, always make sure to keep your positions diversified and keep the risk level under check. Speculative positions should play a small part in your overall portfolio. I would say it's better to keep them below 10 to 20% of your total holdings. Thank you for watching. If you like my content, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel.